The Full Swipe Gaming Laboratory is here to posit another theorem for the theoretical sciences in the competitive Pokemon sphere. One that was also suggested by you, the viewer. We've gone over how stats aren't everything except for speed, which kind of can be everything. However, the only way speed can be of use no matter what is if the Pokemon in question has the move pull to take advantage of it. Nobody cares if your plus six speed Choice Scarf Magikarp is going first when it's just using Splash, for example. But if it was using some move that currently doesn't exist, which let's say, set stealth rock and spikes at the same time then it would be a big deal that brings us to the subject of today's video move pulls and how while they aren't everything they sure come close it's not just in relation to speed either think of all the super strong or super bulky pokemon which fail to do anything of note because they don't have decent moves to use once they hit the field an amazing move pull can easily compensate for a pokemon lacking in other areas conversely a pokemon with great attributes but lacking a move pull is often left out to dry this is what we're covering today and what we will now refer to as the flareon theorem with move pull updates over the generations this can sometimes be generational so we'll pick from a different host of examples Scizor is famously one of the best Pokemon of all time, and has been for quite some time. However, as long as it held this elite status, it has not always been so excellent. In fact, it was thoroughly middling for multiple generations, and was in fact a perfect example of the Flareon theorem. Scizor was catapulted to greatness in Generation 4, where it received just about everything that we associate with how good it is. Diamond and Pro gave it U-turn, the technician ability, reliable recovery in Roost, and physical pursuit. Then Platinum came along and rocketed to superstardom with the addition of Bullet Punch, making it by far the number one most popular Pokemon in the metagame until after both Latias and Salamence had been banned, which was so far into the generation it wasn't long before Black and White came around. Platinum giving Scizor superpower was highly significant as well, and Heart Gold and Soul Silver even gave Scizor superb Bug Stab, which didn't force it to switch out in the form of Technician Boosted Bug Bite. Scizor never stopped, continuing its excellence in Gen 5 and beyond. But then you stop and ask yourself, scissor has been around since Generation 2, and if it got all these great tools in Gen 4, what was it like before? The answer, not good. Well, it wasn't terrible. It still had good stats, skill typing, and some intriguing moves, but it certainly wasn't commonly used, which was because in practice it offered very little, and what it did offer was A, incredibly specific, and B, not very useful, let alone reliable. For all of Gens 2 and 3, and even in Gen 4 before Platinum gave it Bullet Punch, Scizor wallowed in relative obscurity. Of course, players experimented with it, but such tests always resulted in abandonment upon realizing there was a good reason Scizor didn't see use. It just didn't have a good enough move pull. Swords Dance and High Attack, yeah sure, but it didn't have the stabs to pull it off. It was mostly reliant on the paltry likes of Hidden Power Bug. Its coverage wasn't very strong either. In Gen 2, it was unable to hit steals at all, and Gen 3's Brick Brick wasn't exactly the wall-shattering behemoth Scizor needed to be. It needed more instant power because it was slow and not bulky enough to make up for it, especially since its only healing option came in the form of Gen 3's Morning Sun, which, being affected by weather, made it horrible in the permanent sand-infested metagame of Advance. Scizor always seemed promising. In Gen 3, it could potentially use a Select Berry Reversal set, unaffected by that same sand unlike other users of the move like Heracross, and going down to 1 HP would also provide it a swarm boost for HP bug. But far too many things had to go right for Scizor to pull off this sweep with any semblance of reliability whatsoever. Maybe once in a while to catch someone off guard, maybe, if you could somehow remove all of the flying types and Gengar that completely destroyed it. Scizor's only real niches before Bullet Punch were a different kind of BP, that being Baton Pass, where it could hand off Swords Dance, Agility, or Iron Defense to Pokemon that were more capable of using the boost, because Scizor itself certainly wasn't much of a threat even with them, and that really just speaks to the power of Baton Pass. Before Scizor was the Scizor we all know today, it was one of the most frustrating cases of wasted potential thanks to a great attack stat and intriguing typing held back by a complete lack of threatening moves, thereby making it a perfect example of the Flareon Theorem.
The category of bland Pokemon may seem a bit vague, but the basic idea behind this placement is that there are far too many Pokemon that could qualify for the Flareon theorem and tend to share the same fundamental reason for what makes their move pool lacking. So we've decided to group them together. We've considered several bland Pokemon in the Bastiodon theorem, so we won't rehash them too much. But here's the gist. The reason Pokemon like Bastiodon and Dust Noir, i.e. slow bulky walls, are completely terrible, as opposed to other slow bulky walls like Toxapex and Lalomola, which have been elite forever, is their lack of move pool. Of course, there are other differences like their typing and abilities, but Bastiodon and Noir's problem isn't necessarily getting on the field. It's making something happen when they do get on the field. They don't have the insanely spammable, universally crippling knockoff, nor do they fortify their own switching ability with reliable recovery, or support their team through Heal Bell or Wish, or anything of the sort. Their move pools are not necessarily bad, but far too generic and unremarkable for what these Pokemon bring to the table otherwise. The issue does not just apply to slow, bulky walls either. Many offensive Pokemon are similarly plagued. Just look at Regilecki, poised to deal utterly obscene amounts of electric damage, but reduced to a more or less wasted team slot because it is unable to damage ground types. Regilecki's move pool itself isn't bad, as Rapid Spin and Dual Screens off that ridiculous speed set has a ton of promise, but it's not a threatening Pokemon, and the support it brings isn't anywhere near as central enough to make it a good one either. Regilecki is an example of not just an offensive Pokemon which is left severely wanting for moves to actually make it threatening. If it existed in a generation with just hidden power and no other additions to its move pool, it'd likely be one of the most terrifying Pokemon around, but it's also an example of a Pokemon of a certain type held back by its inability to damage its resist. It's far from the only electric this applies to. See the sad story of Luxray, but many other types are well known for this issue. Arguably the most significant is water. There are so many water types out there and so many of them so excellent that there is never a shortage of competition. Thus, one can't coast on just being a water type. If you're a generic water type without any significant distinguishing traits on top of that, a Pokemon like Luminion or Pre-Drizzle, Politoed, and Pelipper, you will be amongst the most forgettable Pokemon there are. Grasses are similar. Their inherent traits may be good, but the likes of Maractus, Carnivine, and Meganium are never going to be seen over their competition. Of course, even more successful Pokemon can also be examples of the Flareon Theorem. Take Cresselia, a superb wall which is nevertheless constantly fighting its own pallid move pool. It is nearly impossible to directly threaten the opponent with it unless their team collapses to moves like Thunder Wave and Toxic in general, and Cress's recovery options are nightmarishly unreliable, either stuck with the 8pp weather affected moonlight or rest, which makes it even more passive than it already is. Cresselia tends to get a pass because its defensive profile is just that good, but make no mistake, in terms of move pool, it is as bland as it gets. After so many examples of Pokemon held back by their lack of move pool, let's briefly shift course to illuminate the power of a good move pool. This is best illustrated by Pokemon which are not so impressive in and of themselves, but their move pool really elevates them. Like yes, Mewtwo and Dialga and such having amazing move pools, but they also have absurd stats so it's not quite the same. The most obvious example is Smeargle, perfectly illustrating the power of the move pool better than arguably anything else. Its go-to strategies ever since Gen 2 to, have been those that are the most fundamentally powerful in the game, letting Smeargle pull them off in spite of its awful stats. So Sleep and either Entry Hazards or Baton Pass, the latter which Smeargle has been a significant contributor in getting banned. Clefable always seems to pop up in videos like this, but it very much applies. Clefable is of course a confluence of many different attributes, an absurdly good ability, a stat spread which winds up being just good enough, and the amazing typing that is Mono Fairy in Gen 6 and later. But its move pool is very much a part of what makes it so good, since those previous traits all let it get on the field. Once it's on the field, it's using its amazing move pool to make things happen, and it has no shortage of things to make it happen, as it is positively overflowing with incredible options. Clefable's support capabilities are the most immediately apparent. Stealth Rock, Knock Off, Encore, Thunder Wave, and two amazing healing abilities in Soft Boiled and Wish. But it's also so good to deal with so many different Pokemon, because it has all the coverage in the world, and also one of the best boosting options in Calm Mind. In more extreme examples, consider Mew and Deoxys Speed and Defense. Mew's base 100 stats across the board are impressive, especially in the first four generations, but the reason it finds itself uber in those generations is not because of its stats, it's because its move pool is almost Smeargle-esque. And on a Pokemon that's actually good in its own right, that's terrifying. If Smeargle boosted its stats, the threat came from it passing to something else. Mew could do that as well, but it could also just mess you up with the boost by itself, or it could become an impenetrable wall, or pretty much 
much anything it sets its eye on. The specified Deoxys form have great stats for sure, but those stats are in service of their move pulls, which pretty much means stealth rock and spikes and taunt. Yes, they can do other things, but the reason they have been repeatedly banned from OU is because they were too efficient simply at getting hazards and denying setup from the opposition. Even Pokemon that simply attempt to be pale Deoxys imitations, like offensive lead Skarmory, have a niche based entirely on the strength of those moves. Moves so good they're worth sacrificing an entire Pokemon at the beginning of the match for. Finally, funnily enough, Cresselia also deserves a mention here. It doesn't usually use this move when acting as a wall, thanks to its counterintuitive self-sacrificial nature, though it's not to say it hasn't been used to decent effect, but Cress's access to Lunar Dance has provided it with an incredible, unique niche on hyper offense teams. Lunar Dance defers from Healing Wish in that it also restores the power points of a Pokemon's moves, and this is absolutely enormous in supporting threats like Leaf Storm Superior and especially Substitute Protect Suicune, which tend to run out of PP before they can fully finish a team off. Cresselia brings them back for another round of terror against a weakened team, which is as game-breaking as you get when it's often difficult enough for opposing teams to withstand such threats once. And of course, if the situations call for it, Crest can also revive other threats like Volcarona as well. Crest's niche really does revolve around Lunar Dance, which can be seen in the awkward stages when Crest first comes in but isn't ready to sacrifice itself yet. It can struggle to make things happen despite attempts to do so through tactics like Trick, Thunder Wave, and Screens. Its niche really is just to sacrifice itself for a teammate and what a move Lunar Dance is, letting one essentially play with two Suicunes or Volcaronas or whatever threat it is, and in doing so creating an entire niche of it on a Pokemon that otherwise struggles to accomplish much. Slackoff was introduced in Generation 3 and dished out to Pokemon known for their laziness. At first, it was just the signature move of the Slacking line, but in Generation 4, its distribution rightfully increased to including other such lovers of taking it a little too easy, like the Slowpoke family. Other recipients included the Hippowdon and Infernape line. Not immediately obvious choices, but Pokes you could see using the move for sure. No new users of Slackoff were added until Generation 8 where Mr. Rhyme of all Pokemon received the move. Another choice which might seem unusual at first, but some good arguments for it could definitely be made, no problem. Then in Generation 9, the Skeledurge line and Belly Bolt received the move. Similar deal. Where is this going? Well, there's no issue with any of these Pokemon getting slack off in and of themselves, but when these Pokemon receive slack off, yet Snorlax still doesn't have it after all this time, then something is rotten in Dendemil Town. Snorlax is far and away the most famously lazy Pokemon of all time. It desires quite literally nothing more than to sleep sleep and eat, not even caring if it blocks the road of passing trainers. This is a level of slacker them that makes the main characters from Clerks look like highly motivated go-getters by comparison. The admission of slack off from Snorlax's move pool is not just a design problem, it is one that completely wraps Lax's competitive viability. If Lax had this one addition to its move pool, and let us take this time to remind you that this is a Pokemon that learns Psychic for some reason, amongst the many other bizarre options populating its move pool, if Lax had this one move, which was seemingly designed with it in mind, it would be completely different. It's had longevity issues since Sand and Spikes dominated days of Gen 3. When you are the slowest Pokemon around and have nearly no resistances, in addition to staggering vulnerability to passive damage, you need to have a reliable method of healing yourself, not rest even when you are as bulky as Lax is. Here's just one example with Slack Off. Gen 3 Snorlax becomes a superb Zapdos answer, as opposed to being the easiest way to trick yourself into thinking you're not weak to Zapdos right before it bowls you over. Slack Off doesn't fundamentally solve every issue Snorlax has, but it does make it a much, much better Pokemon in every conceivable way. Simply having it in its move pool is better. It doesn't even have to actually include it in its moveset. The opponent having to take into consideration the fact that Snorlax can heal shapes both team building and in battle decisions. As comically deep as Snorlax's move pool is, most of these options don't actually do much of anything for it. Yeah, while well, Gen 8 gave Snorlax Hydro Pump. Now that's not totally useless, it's just missing the one move it really, really needs. And finally, the Pokemon this theorem is named for. Okay, Flareon isn't an amazing Pokemon to begin with. Its flaws of lackluster speed, poor physical bulk, and weaknesses to common moves are incredibly easy to exploit without thinking twice about it. However, Flareon's also got some cool stuff going for it. Its defensive profile actually isn't bad. Wish is always a great move, and base 110 special defense can do solid things. Specially defensive fire types have had solid niches across many a metagame. What really stands out about Flareon, though, is that gigantic base 
base 130 attack stat. That's the same as the monstrous Garchomp. This goes with Fire Stab, one of the scariest offensive types in the game. This fire typing also means Flareon is a physical attacker completely unafraid of being burned. In fact, its amazing flash fire ability means it welcomes being hit by a Will-O-Wisp or Lava Plume or whatever other fire move. As in addition to the excellent utility of being completely immune to fire, being hit by those moves actually powers up Flareon's own fire moves even more. Sure, Flareon's not that fast, but most walls are going to be slower, so it can be an excellent lower tier wall breaker. Not much is going to want to switch into that Flare Blitz. Oh right, Flareon, despite being a physically oriented fire type that literally has fire inside of it and has flare in its name, is unable to learn a move which involves it cloaking itself in fire and charging at the opponent. That makes total sense. Okay, Flareon actually did finally learn Flare Blitz in Gen 6, but at that point, Power Creep was too strong for it to really make any use of it. Had it had the moves in Gens 4 and 5 like it should have all along, its competitive career would have been very different, like an NU style Arcanine or Entei, except much, much stronger. With Fire Fang as its best physical fire stab though, Banded Flareon was pretty much the least scary thing in the world. What makes this particularly cruel is that in Platinum, each of the original evolutions got a cool new move. Vaporeon got Muddy Water, Jolteon got Discharge, and Flareon got Lava Plume. Yes, they're thematically linked via their 30% secondary effect, but was that really worth depriving Flareon of a move it so desperately needed and should have already had in Diamond and Pearl? And if it was, could it really not have been amended in Heart Gold and Soul Silver? Apparently not. Instead, Flareon was mocked with another move that, like Flare Blitz, was outstanding, just not what Flareon needed. This time around, it was Heal Bell. Wish, Lava Plume, Heal Bell. Defensive Flareon is an interesting Pokemon for sure, but it shouldn't have come at the expense of it doing what it was meant to, dishing out Flare Blitzes exactly as strong as Garchomp's Outrage. Funnily enough, the exact same thing applied to Entei before the event towards the tail end of Heart Gold and Soul Silver. It too was a fire type with a high attack stat that lacked any usable physical fire sap and wasn't very good at all as a result. Of course, it then did go on to get Flare Blitz and carve out an excellent niche for itself. It even got Sacred Fire in the same generation Flareon finally got Flare Blitz, just to rub further burning salt in the already searing wound. Justice for Flareon. And that's it! Obviously, you can have a great move pull and still not succeed, as Snorlax is not exactly lacking in options, yet it still lacks what it really needs. It goes to show just how important move pulls are. It might seem obvious, but you can hit the field as much as you want. Without the moves to make something happen once you do, you're out of luck. Thanks for watching, everyone. And as always, if you liked the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about the Flareon Theorem? What other Pokemon would you have put on this list? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments. Also, thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.